Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Historic Railroads Week. This is your friendly railroad tycoon and chair of the History Consortium, Jeff Greenewald. And I'm so happy to have everyone here tonight. This is uh, the History Consortium is a brand new group. And this is our very first program. And we're so excited tonight. We've got Jim Leonard from the Cumberland County Historical Society is going to talk about workers of the rail. And don't forget to tune in every night this this week and uh tomorrow night we've got rails to york so please join us for that and now without any further ado here's jim leonard from the cumberland county historical society it's all yours jim thank you very much jeff uh, um, i'll just remind everybody i'm jim leonard from the historical society of east pensbro um, i'm glad to be part of this program it's been exciting this year to uh, uh, be part of the cumberland county uh, uh, programs that they've been doing throughout the uh, winter and into the spring and now into the fall. Um, I've been uh, blessed to have uh, worked on the railroad for 38 years and uh, over that period of time I was a clerk and um, I got to work a lot of different places on the railroad in Enola Yard and sometimes in Harrisburg Yard. Um, so I'm going to start out by giving you a little bit of my genealogy. Um, I, it's one of my sidelines, uh, I have uh, been doing research for a number of years now, but the, the one thing I want to focus on is that I'm a fourth generation railroader. My great grandfather, Levi Lewis Leonard, who was born in 1852 and died in 1910, he was from Marysville. And when I was doing research on him, I found out in the uh, 1870 census that he had worked on the Pennsylvania Railroad in the cutting shed. Now, exactly where that was located, I'm not sure. I couldn't find that out. I have to give a wild guess as it may have been down in Marysville Yard since he lived west of Marysville. My grandfather was James Bell Leonard, and he was born in 1894 and died in 1960. He worked almost 50 years on the railroad, and he worked as a welder and steel cutter. Now, that steel cutter was a person who uh, cut up, beat up, uh, railroad cars, and then they would recycle them to the steel mill to be melted down and recycled. My father was James Bell Leonard, and he was born in 1922 and passed away in 2016. Now, he worked in the yard as a crew caller, jitney driver, and he was in the yard working for 30 years. When he first started uh, working on the railroad, he would actually ride a bicycle out into Enola and knock on doors to get railroaders up to go to work when he was given an order to get a crew out. Um, as time went on, of course, he got to be driving a vehicle. And uh, one of his jobs was a crew caller, and that was a slash jitney driver. Um, being a crew caller, he would actually take orders from the yard master uh, to go out and get a crew who had just come in off of a train and bring them into the brick office and sign off uh, when they were done with their train service. He would also take crews who were signing up for work and take them out to their uh, job position out at, on, uh, on the railroad somewhere in the yard to take a train out. Um, he also um, carried ice whenever they needed ice in the cabin when they had a caboose. Uh, he also had to carry out or train orders out to uh, different uh, crews to uh, know what they were to do when they went out on the railroad. And uh, he also had to carry batteries and radios out to the men when they needed to uh, communicate by radio later in the years. My brother, Robert, he worked as an electrician in the yard. He was in an Enola diesel shop for 35 years. Brother Charles, he worked as a yard brakeman for about five years and then he got furloughed and decided to stay out of the rail industry. I hired in 1965 after I got out of the United States Army Security Agency where I uh, copied Morse code in high speed. So my typing skills were good enough for me to become a clerk when I hired on the railroad. Um, I worked in the brick office, excuse me, from 1965 through 1980. We called crews to work, of course, and uh, we um, had, a, had a real good office in there, uh, in the brick office, uh, calling crews. We had a a good workforce in there that worked together to make sure the crews all got out to work whenever they were called for their train. Um, from 19, 
80 through 1985, I got a job verifying cruise time cards to make sure that I got paid properly. My, my next 12 years, I worked in the Enola diesel shop and also the Enola car shop. Um, I worked about three or four different jobs in there because I was had an opportunity to, to either bid a new job or I got bumped off of a job because of somebody older than me taking my position from me. So that was just the way it was on the railroad. Uh, you worked according to seniority. Now, uh, my last five years, um, 1998 through 2003, I worked at the Harrisburg Trail Van Terminal. And when I was over at the Harrisburg Trail Van Terminal, uh, I inspected tractor trailers bringing um, uh, containers into the yard and also taking containers out of the yard. Um, I retired in uh, 2003. And upon retiring, um, I took a month off and then went down to the Historical Society and started volunteering with Herb Kruger. Now I'm gonna to start to talk about the men who actually worked in Enola Yard between the time period of around 1953 to the 1970s. And the reason I chose that period of time is because it was the end of the steam era and it was also the beginning of the electric engine era and the diesel engine era. Now during that period of time, of course, we had the railroad police and we're gonna talk about them because they have to keep the railroad secure. And back in the earlier days, they had to deal with hobos and trespassers um, more than anything. Uh, later on, because of um, uh, thievery, robbers, they had to deal with robbers, uh, taking stuff of, off of cars, uh, stuff that was exposed to uh, the general public that they could get down on the railroad and actually take and break open the seals and open the doors and rifle out all of the stuff that they were trying to rob from the railroad. The next men I wanna talk about are the track men. And the reason I say men is because I don't recall any women working in the track department at that period of time. They may have them now, I'm not sure. But the track men uh, basically laid track, they laid ties and they repaired damage to the same. There were uh, men on the railroad called the fruit growers. Now they were, subcontracted by the railroad to actually put ice on the reefer cars to keep the fresh produce cold, the meat cold uh, that was being uh, uh, taken from one end of the railroad to the other. When they came into Enola Yard, they might only be halfway to their destination. So they had to keep that stuff cold. So they would either put ice on those cars or else they would have to later on, of course, uh, work on the refrigeration equipment and make sure they had fuel to make the, sure the refrigerators were running at the proper cooling uh, to keep all the fruit and vegetables and uh, meat uh, the proper temperatures. Now I'm going to talk about the car inspectors. These were men again, of course. Uh, they maybe have women now doing car inspector work. I'm just not sure about that. What they would do is inspect uh, cars for structural damage, and they tested their mechanical signal equipment uh, when they were out doing their job as car inspectors. Car repairmen actually repaired the car of damage whenever they would uh, receive any kind of significant damage that they would take them out of service. There was another location called the Enola Dormitory or the Bunk Room. The Bunk Room had one clerk working and that was a 24 hour operation. So there were clerks working all around the clock. They worked like a hotel clerk in the uh, uh, bunk room. Uh, what they would do is they would register a crew who came in um, to Enola uh, away from their home terminal. Uh, to give you an idea what that might be, let's say a crew who went to work in Altoona would take 16 hours to actually bring a train into Enola. When they finally got here, they would sign off and then they would walk up to the Enola dormitory and uh, get a room for the night. Maybe after six or seven hours, they'd get a call for their next train to go west, back out to Altoona, haul on a train. So that was for all destinations coming into Enola. They might be coming from the south or the east or the west or the north, and there were just hundreds and hundreds of crews coming in and out of Enola all the time. And uh, 
being that the, this was our way from home terminal, they had to find a place to get something to eat and they had to find a place to take their rest. Most of the time, they were required to come out on duty after eight hours rest. That was during the period of time that I worked down there. Things may have changed because the Hours of Service Act has changed over the years. And uh, it's a little hard to describe that, but that was the reason why. Now I want to go into the Enola shop. The Enola shop was, a fir was first a roundhouse, which handled the steam engines who came into Enola. And they would go into the roundhouse for maintenance. Uh, they may have uh, had some damage coming into the Enola yard from their trip. Uh, they may have to have some kind of scheduled maintenances. They had a scheduled maintenance uh, document, uh, just like an automobile would. Uh, every three months, they'd have to have certain filters uh, changed out. They would have to have oil changes. Uh, they would have to have all kinds of fittings greased. And, uh, of course, uh, they'd have to be fueled up either with coal, since they were coal cars, um, and water to make steam to make those uh, steam engines run. Um, later on, uh, when steam engines were no longer running engine uh, running trains, they had uh, the development of uh, steam or uh, diesel engines, and they also had electric engines. Now, they had a new uh, diesel shop that was a little bit west of the roundhouse. Um, it was a little, a little difficult to see the map behind me, but this is the middle of the yard, which expanded from West Fairview all the way to the west end of Enola towards Overview. And in the middle would have been the roundhouse. After the roundhouse was torn down and a new diesel shop was built, it was built about 500 yards west of the roundhouse and the new diesel shop of course, did all that kind of maintenance that I discussed about uh, the steam engines on a diesel engine. They would have to have their scheduled maintenances to take out their filters and uh, do all the same kind of work for a diesel engine in similar fashion. They had a, an electric pit, that, which was right next to the diesel shop, and that's where they would work on the electric engines and uh, the type of engines I'm talking about are the GG1 and the E44 engine which would, would run with the, uh, uh, the electric wire connection uh, to the engine to, to uh, receive its power on those big grids. Um, the people I want to talk about now are the ones that actually worked in the shops. Um, there was a shop superintendent, a foreman, pipe fitters, machinists, laborers, ma maintenance men, uh, for steam engine uh, repair, and they also had maintenance uh, department along with clerks over there in the uh, uh, roundhouse. Later on, when the diesel shop was put into operation, they had to add into that group of men that I just mentioned, electricians. Uh, they have since uh, employed women to do some of these menial jobs uh, over a period of time, um, let's just say in the last 20 years since I haven't been there anymore, uh, they have women working all the same type of jobs that men work. Even when I worked, there were uh, women working as engineers running trains uh, back in the 1998 era area. Um, uh, I do recall that uh, some of the other positions had uh, women working on those positions uh, uh, due to the liberation uh, movement. Uh, they started receiving uh, work the same as the men did in, in the same fashion, and uh, it was only rightfully so. Uh, to the west of the diesel shop was the coal wharf, which still stood all the way up through the 1980s until they finally tore it down. Now, the coal wharf was a big building that held the coal that was uh, used into uh, the uh, coal car on a uh, steam engine, and uh, they also had to, of course, water the steam engine to make steam and power so that they could haul those trains. The electric pit was used for repairing and maintaining electric engines, and they had to have qualified electricians to do that. Uh, when I had uh, first hired over there in the diesel shop, there were still quite a few electric engines, engines around, and the most that they had to do as far as electricians went is they had to make sure the big batteries were charged up and powered to uh, be replaced in there to uh, make sure that they could handle uh, 
pulling a, a, a train with those uh, uh, with the amount of power that they needed according to the size of a train that was going down the highway. There was an oil lab in the middle of the yard. Now the oil lab was a testing laboratory that would actually test the oil in, on a diesel engine that would come into the yard and they would test that oil to make sure that there weren't any, there weren't any kind of internal engine damage uh, going on that they needed to pull an engine out of service and repair. Um, this was a technical thing that uh, had to be done constantly with uh, uh, big diesel engines. There was a huge air plant in the middle of the yard. Uh, I don't know who maintained that. I think the diesel shop had maintenance guys that actually had to uh, work on those big power uh, units. What they would do was that they were gigantic pumps that would actually pump air out into the yard in pipes underneath the tracks. And what they would do is they would hook up the air to a train that was ready to go out on the railroad and they would be able to hook it up and test the uh, braking system to make sure the brakes worked before they actually hooked up the engine and then the power plant from the engine, of course, to uh, force that uh, air into for the air braking. Um, so that was basically why they had to have these uh, huge uh, airlines running all through the yard, east side and west side in Enola. One of the biggest uh, operations going on in Enola, back in my era, especially the brick office, was the hub of operation dealing with crews and trains in and out of the yard. There was a terminal superintendent, and he was a, the supervisor over several train masters and two yard masters in the brick office. The two yard masters in the brick office were in charge of the uh, eastbound classification yard and the westbound classification yard. Now, a classification yard was um, designed to um, have a train come in from like the west side and come over the hump and be broken up. All the cars would be separated and divided up. I'm going to give, hold my arm out like this, like this is the hump and, and, a, and a train of cars was coming down the hump. They would cut those cars apart and keep pushing them over the hump and they would get down and be uh, separated in, into these separate different tracks. And they were like uh, 48 on the east side and 35 on the west side in Enola. They would actually separate those cars until they had enough of cars on a track to make a new train. They would couple them all up, get the braking ready to go, hook a cabin to them during the caboose days and hook an engine up to them, get a crew out there and get that train on the road again. Now, a train crew, uh, there were several different types of train crews. Um, uh, the road train crew was usually an engineer, a fireman, conductor, maybe two brakemen sometimes earlier or later on. And when they started cutting crews down to uh, uh, one and two man crews, there might have only been one brakeman. Um, and the yard crew, uh, the, the yard crews, they were uh, a, a total complete different type of an operation. A yard crew was an engine man, conductor, one or two brakemen, and there were usually four crews on duty in the Enola yard back in the humping days when they had both sides of the Enola yard uh, operating as two different classification yards. They would have a, uh, uh, a crew, two crews at the east end of Enola yard to handle getting trains ready. And they would have two train, two, yeah, two train crews at the west end of Enola yard to handle getting trains ready to go westbound and northbound. They were called the 4A and 6A at the east end and the 5A and 7A at the, at the west end. Um, I got to talk a little bit about the crews, uh, the crew dispatcher. That's what I did when I was uh, working my first 15 yard years in, in, in the railroad. They ha we had a chief clerk in the brick office, an assignment clerk, a clerk uh, that they had it back there as a secretary working for the superintendent. In the crew office, we had a lead clerk and we had three crew dispatchers on duty. We had an assignment clerk in, in our office and it was a 24 hour operation, just like Enola Yard was. And the crew dispatchers were um, uh, in three different positions in our crew office. One would be a yard crew dispatcher who handled uh, filling vacancies on yard crews that needed to be filled every day. There was a, a, a crew dispatcher who called crews 
east and south, and there was a separate crew dispatcher calling crews west and north. And like I said, they were on duty uh, 24 hours a day, uh, three different clerks, of course, you know, A trick, B trick, and C trick. Make sure I didn't forget anybody. Um, let's go on to switch tenders. There were actually four main switch tenders in Enola Yard. Now these switch tenders, there were there were four of them. One was called 4B, W11, 23D, 23B, and 111D. Now there were two, one at each end of the yard and one in the, at the uh, in the middle of the yard on each side. And those, those switch tenders handled the main switches where trains were coming in and out of the yard, and they had to make sure that the switches were thrown so that these trains were put on the proper track as they were coming in or going out of the yard. Uh, they had them on duty 24 hours a day, too, uh, eight hours, of course, in each shift. On the hump, they had retarder operators. Now, these three retarder operators had one of the most sensitive and difficult jobs on, on, the, on the railroad during the hump operation in Enola Yard. Um, on the east side, there was an A-tower operator. The A-tower operator would get his orders from the uh, brick office as to a train that was coming in that needed to be broken up and divided into new tracks. Now, according to the weight of the car, the retarder operator would throw, throw a, a handheld switch, which would put a certain amount of pressure on the car so it wouldn't get down over the hill too fast. And he also had to, with his other hand, throw the proper switch to make sure that car went down the right track. Now, he was A tower. B tower would have been over here, C tower over here. Those cars would be going down the one side where this other retarder operator on duty would be doing the same thing. He would be throwing the switch and he would be putting on the brakes to slow down the car if it was too heavy to make sure it didn't crash into the back of a train and break the knuckle. Of course, if they broke a knuckle, that put a stop on that track until they got out there and got that repair. The, the C tower operator did the same thing on his side of the yard. They had 48 tracks to deal with. So those men had a very difficult job, job. Up on the hump, I told you they had to separate those cars going down over the hump. They had a car cutter that would walk alongside the train. And he would pull a lever looking at a sheet of paper to see what car number he was dealing with and how many cars he had to release at one time. He was constantly walking back and forth until that whole train went down the hump. He had to make sure the cars were separated at the proper distance so that they wouldn't be going down too fast, that the retarder operator wouldn't get log jammed. This was a very difficult job situation going on over the hump. Um, uh, one of the one of the most horrible things that I can recall as a young man hiring on the railroad happened when a brakeman down in the field where those cars were going down into those new tracks was on a car riding it. And they had to do that and actually turn the wheel sometimes to brake it. So they, they actually had a wheel brake. It was hooked to a chain that would help to put the brakes on. And somehow this car got going too fast and it rammed into the back of another car and he was thrown from the car and his arm separated and it pulled his arm off. And it was just one of the most tragic things that I can remember happening during my uh, growing up days on the railroad. And I, the reason I say that is because it's something that was happened, not a lot, but could happen. Men got uh, cut up, they, got, they would fall, they would get run over by those wheels, uh, steel on steel, Cut them right in half. Uh, many, many men got injured out on the railroad and, and due to uh, not following the rules and regulations of safety that they had to do, and other things were just simple accidents that happened. 
and uh, the railroad was a very dangerous place to work. Uh, safety was of the utmost concern uh, of everybody out there. Uh, when they first went to work, most of these men had to uh, look at a safety rule of the day, memorize it, and know it because they would be tested on it sometime before they went home by their conductor. And these safety rules were driven into these men uh, when they were working on the railroad. Uh, very important, very important. Um, I do recall one incident that happened to me. Um, when I first hired, before I became a crew dispatcher, my first month out there, um, they had a job called a number taker. Now, what you had to do was take a clipboard out there and get down a track of a train that was ready to be uh, gotten run out, got run out of the yard. And what they needed to do was they needed to know every car number on that track in the proper order so that they could get the tickets ready for the conductor so that he would have, you know, an idea of where the cars were on his train. Now, one night I was out there in the rain and between the tracks, it was about the size of this desk, which was about three and a half, four feet. And you had to get down the track between the two trains that may have been out there and the number and the one that you're taking, the number of. You would be looking up with your flashlight at night, trying to find the number, trying to write it in a number on the clipboard and not realizing it, your jacket is rubbing against this train going by behind you and it snags on the back of some of his uh, braking. And all of a sudden you find yourself getting drugged down the track you have to really get moving and get your clothes off as quick as possible because it wasn't going to let go of your shirt. And that's how men got drugged underneath cars. Um, fortunately, I got my jacket off in time um, or I could have gotten injured very badly. Uh, that was when I was a young man, didn't know any better. and uh, Still on the uh, verge of learning how to be a railroader. Um, I think I've covered most of the positions. Um, I know I've probably missed a lot of the positions of uh, the men that worked out on the yard. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think I'm just going to go to the gentleman that I was talking to when I first came on to see if maybe we could field some questions and maybe I'll try my best to uh, give you an answer as to uh, the best of my ability. Um, there he is. There's Jeff. Good job, Good job, Jeff. Maybe you have something for me. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, we're getting a few things in here, and I'll keep an eye on the questions as they came in. Uh, one one of the things that you mentioned was a uh, a train master. Uh, could, could you describe the duties of, of that person, maybe a uh, some people weren't a little quite clear on exactly who a, a train master was. Well, the terminal superintendent actually ran the yard and he, he would have these uh, younger uh, trainees, train masters, um, even some experienced train masters who were in charge of different sections of the yard. He would actually be over the yard masters and the conductors who were out there working with the crews and he would be one of those guys that would maybe go out there and ask the question do you know the safety rule of the day what's the number and what and what it, what's the verbiage of that safety rule he would test the men he would make sure that the uh, trains were going in and out of the yard on time he would make sure the crews were signed up on time and if they weren't signed up on time why weren't they uh, they they were punctual punctuality was their main function make sure crews got out on time make sure crews got on their trains and uh, make sure the train got out on schedule uh, which didn't happen very often okay very good uh, you you mentioned the uh, railroad police and dealing with hobos uh, periods of time are are you aware of of any periods when there was uh uh, I guess we would call it heavier hobo traffic, uh, like on hard times, uh, 
that 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 you're aware of that maybe there was an increase in hobos and I think when I heard in 1965, that might have been the beginning of the end of that hobo era. Uh, of course, we hear all these old hobo songs. Uh, I think most of those hobo songs were uh, probably written by somebody who was a hobo out in the railroad, uh, you know, running up and down the lines, uh, following trains, riding in empty box cars and so forth. And that was mostly between the, and the I, I'm guessing like the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the only hobo that I can actually recall seeing was back around 1998 over in Harrisburg Yard. I saw a container train going out of the yard and there was a guy underneath the tongue of one of those cars or uh, these, what am I thinking here, tractor trailers hiding under there going westbound. And uh, it was a very dangerous thing for him to do. But yeah, they were starting to thin out between the 1960s and, uh, and our era today. You just uh -huh. don't see it anymore. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, it, it, it sounds like uh, many of the, uh, that it was very, very dangerous work. And uh, uh, so uh, how did, uh, how did the, the folks, especially you talked about the people running the retarders and so forth, uh, must have been a, a lot of stress uh, did, did folks have to deal with a lot of stress in these these various jobs? That was probably one of the most stressful job out there. Sometimes these guys had to take a little R&R. &R. Um, it was very difficult to train these guys. Uh, they trained for a long time before they were actually allowed to work the job. And uh, sometimes they were out there stuck 16 hours a day at times because they didn't have a relief, a qualified man to take their place. That was stress uh, because there was so much, there were so many uh, cars being fed over the hump in an eight hour period. They just had to have total concentration. Uh, so yeah, it was difficult. That That is probably up there number one as far as stressful jobs go. Well, let's see what else we've, uh, what we've uh, got here. Um, for the, uh, the the railroad workers, uh, what were uh, the wages like uh, compared to most of the local folks uh, who lived around the rail yard? Uh, a lot of stress, but uh, what was the comparison? Was it was it worth? Were there, there extra wages for folks who worked at the railroad? I think it was. Uh -huh. I'll, give, I'll give you for instance. Uh, when I was a young boy uh, in high school, my goal was to make ten thousand dollars a year. Uh, you know, that was one of the things I looked forward to. And I knew that was going to be tough because I didn't go to college. <laughs> I went in the Army. And I knew right away $98 a month wasn't going to give me that. So when I hired on the railroad, I couldn't believe I was making $100 a week. Um, I mean, 20 bucks a day? Come on. I mean, that was magic. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and, and we had to qualify on the job. Uh, I had typing skills, but we actually had, had to have on-the-job training and learn how to do the jobs. My job as a clerk, we were probably the least paid uh, employees at the time. The skilled guys, the engineers and the conductors, they made money. They made mileage money or else hourly money. Uh, it depends on which one was greater. And um, their wages were probably twice as much as mine when I hired. So as I... As I got on through my later years in the 1990s through the early 2000s, um, I was making about 38,000 a year, which was pretty darn good for an unskilled, mm -hmm. uh, I shouldn't say unskilled, uneducated, uneducated person. And I would say that most of the guys that were working in freight service and uh, also the, the uh, the laborers and uh, the, the shop guys, those guys were skilled. Those guys were very skilled. And they made probably three times or more than I made out on the railroad. Wages were high, but I think the guys that worked the most stressful jobs were worth every penny of it. Mm -hmm. They were hauling freight that was worth millions of dollars. And their job was very important to make sure that train got over the railroad without getting damaged. Uh, and to make sure that freight got out on time. Uh, they were hauling freight like uh, 
like down here at Sharma's Town, they were they were they were local guy local trains going up through getting feed and uh, cereal and all kinds of different things for from the mill and uh, it, it's just uh, you know you can understand what I'm talking about uh, hauling freight it's just like truck drivers all the stuff they haul they're worth every penny they make because they have a very tough job good well speaking of employees we just got a question here asking uh, how many were employed at Enola Oh gosh, I knew you were going to ask that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it varied. Um, I think when I retired, there were probably less than 300 in the yard in Enola. But during my early days, several thousand, several thousand a day in there working in the Enola yard. And of course, um, back in the 40s, more than that, because uh, uh, the war years, they had they needed a lot of employees because they were they were running thousands and thousands of cars through the yard, uh, home and freight. So um, employees it varied, of course. I'd say from World War II up through the end of the Korean War, that was when it was starting starting to diminish. Uh, thousands of, of uh, men down to maybe the early 50s, maybe 12, 1500, and then it started to dwindle. Because the reason they dwindled is because they were starting to use less men on crews. And uh, also from the 1970s all the way up through this era, the computer age took so many jobs from, from the railroad. Uh, it's really started to, to cut, cut employees down considerably. Okay, uh, Jim, we got a accommodation question and comment here. It says, Jim, were you extra cautious following your near fatal accident involving your coat in the passing train? An angel must have been looking out for you. Wow, your presentation is interesting and informative. Well, we knew that. Uh, oh, thank you, and to CCHS. I'll tell you what, when you find yourself being drug and you are out of control of your footing, and you know you only have a couple of feet between you and, and getting yourself straightened up. It gives you a lot to think about. And uh, I, I just remember I couldn't wait to get back into the brick office, and I never wanted to go out there and do another number taker job in my life. Um, I didn't even have a what you would call a a job that should have been out on the railroad. That should have been a conductor's job. Or a, or a brakeman's job, but of course clerks did that at that time, and uh, but uh, I didn't want to be there anymore. I didn't. I'm, I really had a lot of respect for those guys that worked out there at that point. Uh, you have to understand is the yard is uh, is uh, very wide in the middle, and as it goes from one end to the from the middle to the other end, the the tightness gets smaller and smaller as it as they thin out going down to the other end of the yard and that's why it was so tight where i was and where i got caught so yes i was glad to get out of there and i was definitely more aware of my safety <laughs> no doubt well we're uh, we're getting a lot of comments uh from folks uh looks like we're Gosh, we're, we're reaching out all across the country. We've got folks from Massachusetts. Here's some folk, people from Florida, uh, Oregon, and uh, Southern Colorado. So I think we've got kind of all four corners of the country. Wow. Uh, Jim, you're doing pretty good. Uh, so let's just see if there's any more questions. Uh, there's a mention here of uh, from someone who says it's very interesting, but just mentions my dad worked on the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, so kind of the counterpart out West. So it looks like uh, that is about all the questions that we've gotten, Jim. And uh, wow, thanks so much. This was really interesting. Uh, I was a little bit of a, a rail fan, although I kind of grew up a little too late for the Penzi, uh, but uh, was pretty fascinated by Enola Yards as well. So uh Thank you so much, Jim. We appreciate it very much. And thanks to everybody that uh, listened in tonight from all over the country. 
And uh, thanks for supporting the various historical societies that are part of the, uh, the History Consortium. And I hope folks that you'll tune in uh, tomorrow night for a presentation uh, from the folks down in York County. And with thank that, you. Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you, folks. And good night on behalf of the, his the History Consortium.